welcome everybody. It is Tuesday afternoon, just past one o'clock, and we're going to take up conversation on H96, which is our advocacy <laughs> to creating the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, with us today, so the process for today is going to essentially be a conversation if we have questions about you know elements of the bill from last week that Damien took us through we can certainly ask questions I have some you know some I, I just want to take the next few days to really open this up to our committee conversation on this um, I do see that there is one person so I asked Ron to invite everybody who testified on the apology or on any of these bills that we've heard um, related to social equity this year, uh, last year in this year, so that's H96, um, 387, uh, and, and 273. Ron, did you receive, I received a, a, an email from uh, Wilda White, did she? CC. Yes. yes, it's posted on our page for today. Okay, so I will consider that, you know, as comments as well. Um, and I see that we have uh, Charlene Gallerno on um, from, I uh, presume from Newfane. Charlene, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. Good to see you again. <clears throat> Good to see you again. Um, this is a reminder for the committee, if you remember, Charlene testified on the apology last year and participated in, in some of the conversations last year on, on the apology. And so, um, Charlene, for your perspective and for any guests' perspective, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to um, raise your hand, use the, the hand function so that I can see you. And I think as long as you're, this, you're right now the one guest that we have, we'll just go right around the room introduce ourselves again to you because you can't really see us uh, with these room views but we'll start with representative howard welcome thank you mr chair and good afternoon i am representative mary howard i represent rutland city the southwest district uh five three thank you yeah, I'm a uh, representative Chip Troiano. I represent uh, Hardwick Standard in Walden in the Northeast Kingdom, and I'm the vice chair of this. <coughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, Matt Byron, representative from Virgins uh, in five communities in Northwest Addison County. I am representative Lisa Hango. I represent Franklin Five on the Northwest border with Canada, and that's Highgate, Franklin, Berkshire, and Richford. Hello, it's Charlene, uh, Tiff Bloomley, representing uh, the South End of Burlington. John Kalaki, South Burlington. Joe Parsons, uh, representing the towns of Thompson, Groton, and Newbury. Hi, Charlene, welcome. Uh, representative John Plastic, representing Milton. Hi, I'm Tommy Walter, representing Barry City. And Representative Murphy is out at a meeting. Represent Tom Stevens from Waterbury, representing Waterbury Ducks. Uh, well, I'm sorry, that was old. Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, <laughs> and Fields Court. Sorry, we've had redistricting on our mind. Um, it was just the select board meeting of Huntington talking about redistricting last night. Ten-year-old memories coming back. So um, basically, committee. So again, we'll just I'd just like to open up. Um, the conversation on this, it can be philosophical, it can be actual. Um, and in, you know, and, and Charlene, are you here with interest to, to, to just witness or do you have comments? I don't have any prepared, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go I don't ahead. have any prepared comments at this point, but I have stayed interested and I, I have watched the videos and the hearings from last week and the IC, I'm familiar with ICTJ's work. And I've been continuing my own research, just so you know, around eugenics, particularly role of medicine um, and sort of resistance um, to eugenics. And just to let you all know, I'm actually going to be teaching a course on U.S. eugenics at UVM this summer. 
Um, so I don't have any prepared remarks now, but I am very interested in how this moves forward and the whole issue of reparations or reconciliation. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks for joining us. So committee, um, I just, I, I mean, I have a, a lot of thoughts, of course, about what we heard, but I just like to hear from folks and, and understanding, I just took a list of times that people are gonna be popping in and out, um, testifying or giving short things to the appropriations committee. So I just wanna acknowledge that, you know, we, we won't, you know, feel free to leave when you have to leave, come back when you, and, and come back when you're done, when you're done. Um, so Damien, first of all, we wanted to thank you for putting together that first draft or that next first next draft. Um, <laughs> so second draft 2.2 of, of the bill. I think you really, there's a direct through line through it <clears throat> and a lot to work with there. And I just think it's, um, it was a really good reboot on, on the language and the goals based on what we've heard, based on what we've read. And I think for committee, I think for us, it's as we go through the bill, we're gonna to try to balance what, I guess what OPR was calling a light touch on how we create a committee that is going to be autonomous as much as possible that is going to address what we have so far are three distinct studies, um, <clears throat> as well as the process that goes along with it. So um, the question for us is how prescriptive should we be in places in order to create that autonomy? Um, so that people have the freedom and the trust to, to, to be able to express their truths mm -hmm. to the to the committee that's formed, um, which will then get synthesized into the reports. So, um, so the floor is open. Play like Quaker meeting, and <laughs> people have you know questions. Just raise their hands and let's let us start. I, I actually feel ready to dive right into the bill. Um, if that's where you want to go. I, I really appreciate how far we've come on this. And, um, you know, I think it will remain an iterative process all along. And, and once we go, you know, to the Senate, they'll have their iteration, and then, you know, the public. Well, we we have all the advisors, and there'll be many iterations. So I, I, you know, in a generic way, I'd say be less, at least prescriptive as we can. Mm -hmm. So just trust the process. Which one, though? Which process? <laughs> well, it is, but. Ours are the, are the ones that we create. The ones we create. But I, I, the, the one thing that I think there's a, a, for me, I think there has to be legislative participation somehow. Maybe the outlier committee on that. But if this is a, a, a government initiated thing, I just think when the report comes back, there has to be some kind of government interaction with it because if it's completely by itself but I, I i we discussed that before that's my iteration of that well and participation i mean I, there's several different levels right there's you know once we pass the bill somebody has to choose the selection committee so setting that up <clears throat> You know, who is that where there's, you know, 
an interaction between the government per se, whether it's legislative. I think or it's in the sitting of the commissioners. Choosing the commissioners. That a government participation should be in, in helping to seat the commissioners, yes. Right, so as part of the, either the first process that creates a selection committee or on a selection committee that contributes. On the selection committee. Okay, so. Because um, the idea here is, it, we've heard ideas that have said once the selection committee is done, so that like once the selection committee chooses the commissioners, right? If, if this were an Apollo rocket, that the booster would fall off, right? And the rest of the rocket would keep going forward. Is that what we're, you know, with, you know, but the idea of, we talked last week about the idea that a selection committee should perhaps remain somewhere in case they need to be to replace a commissioner, right? Is that is that that got brought out last week? I think as well. So it's not quite the same as jettisoning jettisoning the, um, the selection committee in total. But I guess I mean if we're going to dive right in, I mean I guess the focus is for me just let's just start at at the be well let's start at. The other section, because I think the first step might be I was rereading the, the Canadian material here where there's a real clear mandate. And of course, its mandate was done by court, a court decision wasn't done, doesn't wasn't done just purely out of a legislative process. But there are elements of it that I think might be useful in helping whether we actually include that as findings or as part of you know the depth of how we describe issues with. Um, how it may help. I think, Damien, did, did you re, did you use when you were creating the the um, responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Who did you refer to in the in there? Oh. Whatever. Uh, when I was creating the responsibilities, uh, I drew. Uh, well, let's see. Off the top of my head, I guess the answer is I don't remember, but uh, I drew a lot from tab two, which is the tab on selection process and criteria. Uh, and that was probably the main piece that I drew from. I did look at uh, some of the other uh, examples in there of uh, truth and reconciliation commissions, uh, but it's hard for me to remember which pieces of which example I incorporated where uh, at this point. Um, I know that in particular, the South African TRC, the Victoria Australia TRC uh, were two that I drew heavily from, um, but uh, there, there may have been others as well. Uh, so it, uh, period of drafting this, <laughs> apart from knowing that I use section or tab two pretty heavily yep. for the selection process. Uh, the rest of it is a bit of a blur at this point, unfortunately. All right, so, <clears throat> so if we were to, um, begin at the beginning, With this, how do we start after the bill? You know, if the bill passes into law, who gets to name the selection committee, and how do we convene that group of people? And right now, I think it's. <coughs> Is it clear? Yeah, so the way the, the current bill is set up, uh, if you, for those of you who have the draft in front of you, uh, section four creates the selection panel, uh, which requires 
basically a selection panel for the selection panel. So this, this particular panel's committee on committees, if you will. Um, nobody's going to go for the jokes at the Senate's expense. <laughs> yeah. and, anyway. uh, it's, it's early in the week. Too close to crossover, okay. <laughs> but uh, there, there are two representatives of the government there. Um, those are the executive director of racial equity and the, and the executive director of the Human Rights Commission. There are then six individuals representing uh, Native Americans, four representing the recognized tribes, and two appointed by the Commission on Native American Affairs. Uh, then five individuals representing disabled Vermonters or Vermonters with disabilities. Uh, and then five more individuals representing Vermonters of color. Um, so right now, there is a, an 18 person panel that selects a panel of seven that works as essentially the hiring committee. Um, so it, this was an effort to take the stakeholders uh, and as I mentioned during my walkthrough, this list of stakeholders isn't, isn't the, the absolute final list. It was just what I could pull from other bills on this and then get them to put together a committee that is a manageable size so that you could hopefully get uh, a fairly rapid and, and nimble hiring process for that, that committee of seven that serves as the selection panel. The selection panel itself uh, is the qualifications of the selection panel are not set out. Um, the, let's just see here, sorry, scrolled too far. So the qualifications for the selection panel are, there are no qualifications set out really. Um, it's just seven individuals that those stakeholders feel will do a good job. So it could be, it could include people who represent the state uh, government, but it more than likely would, would be other people of high standing within Vermont. Um, so the... But it does, sorry, yeah. it would not preclude somebody from that group serving no, it wouldn't preclude anyone who serves as a representative of one of the stakeholders yeah. serving. Okay. Um, so there's no language in here right now that either precludes a stakeholder from serving or they're actually not even limited to appointing people from Vermont. <clears throat> um, so they could appoint someone. Uh, if you remember, one of the South American Truth Commissions appointed the Pope yeah. or named the Pope to the selection panel on the Pope then declined the invitation and was replaced by a different individual. But that something similar to that could theoretically occur here where uh, an individual with, with very high standing uh, is appointed to the selection panel um, by this commission or by this group of stakeholders. The commissioners themselves do have a requirement that they be from Vermont and then have certain, meet certain experiential requirements. I'm not sure I like the idea that they can appoint themselves to the, that the selection panel can appoint themselves as commissioners, if that's what you're saying. Yeah, so that, that is a possibility. The, the limiter, limiter there is that you have 18 stakeholders currently named, could be more, uh, could be less, but they can only name seven individuals to the selection panel. Um, but yes, so, so right now, what could happen is they could choose seven people from the stakeholders and name them to the selection panel. So they, so it's not limited, you know, it, it's not saying like three or four, or it, but it could be the whole seven. Um, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Could be there, seven people yeah. Yeah. from 18. Yeah, no, 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 I got you. Up to seven, is that? <clears throat> well, we haven't, I mean, we haven't nailed it down, but we've just been using that as a, yes. as an example. Um, Right, and there's, yeah, there's no uh, restriction on who those seven individuals could be. That's something that you certainly could add, um, but in the existing draft, it's not there. 
Representative Banks. Okay, I think I misunderstood. Um, so the the original 18 stakeholders could nominate themselves up to seven of themselves to the selection panel, but the selection panel cannot nominate themselves as commissioners or appoint themselves as commissioners. Oh, That's uh, where I was going with that. So that, there is actually uh, language in here that prevents them from naming themselves be. as commissioners. Um, <clears throat> so it just says that they shall select three individuals to serve as commissioners. Yeah, not for, I don't think the intent is to choose. Yeah. Them, that could be read. Okay, very, that's what I was trying yeah, to That could be very that. easily read. It's mm -hmm. that you chose it from the selection panel. No, they should. Mm -hmm. I think Thank I you. think everything that we've heard is that, that there sh they should not be part of that process. If they want to be commissioners, then they can't. They shouldn't be on the selection panel. If they want to apply for commissioner. So, so do we need language saying that? Yeah. Yep. So, do, so we're going from 18 people to seven. To seven, right. right. But no other stops, right? That's that's the the two buckets of process for formation of this. No, <clears throat> eighteen to seven to three. Three. Okay, so yes. there is like another. That's where I was getting. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Confused yeah. as well. I, yeah. And I think that what I mean, what's interesting, and I'm not sure what the best way <clears throat> to get this across, unless it's in legislative intent somehow, or in our goals to write whatever the mandate is, is that there is no. Well, we start with this larger committee of stakeholders that we name, that there's no requirement that the seven people come out there. They can, you know, they can pick, um, they can pick anybody to be on, just as the selection committee can then pick within the limitations that we may create the commissioners. Like, so that doesn't, the commissioners don't, I, we have to be, I, I'm trying to be sensitive to the comment of, from ICTJ about sometimes being inclusive, maybe limiting to the experiential part that the, of the commissioners having the experience that might be needed to, but I think it sounds like I mean, we're not, not denying people the right to apply for that or to be nominated for that. It's just sort of a, it's sort of a, a <clears throat> warning's not the right word, advice is not the right word, but it's just sort of, do we put that, the question out there is that do we put that down on a paper that, that they need not be from the original 18 groups, so. Yeah, that. so I, I think that was kind of, so clarification, obviously the, the three can't come from the seven, but say of the 11, say, you know what I'm saying? So say seven people go from the 18. We obviously know they can't go to the seven. Could the 11 be eligible for the three? Uh, well, I think that they can apply. No, 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 I'm saying that, but like, do we want to like, because that's a degree of extension, right? Like, does that? That's, I mean, yeah, that was kind of exactly where my mind was. Um, it's very simple to say. Uh, when you're in a group of people to be like, I don't want to be on the selection panel because I'd like to be on a committee yeah. or mm -hmm. commissioner. So, and so like you would have, you know, like, then you're kind of <clears throat> circumventing the whole idea of our intent. That is that the selection panel? Yeah, right. That's, that's right. That's the balance between saying, you know, and I think we heard concerns. <sighs> Actually, we didn't hear the concerns up front, but what we heard was the resolution from Maine, right? Mm -hmm. With the four, the four, federally recognized tribes in the state agreed that no one on the selection panel and apparently the commissioners would be members of those four tribes. And that was done to try to create or unplug the possibility that, that you know, someone may feel like someone else was getting ahead or it was only going to operate for somebody else and that there was a sense of neutrality. And I don't know, Damien, if there's a way to put, put that word in perhaps as a way of signaling that neutrality may be, you know, one of the, one of the things to consider. I don't know if that's the, the qualification idea. for the um, commissioner. 
Well, there were there were those lists. I mean, they, they, <clears throat> that they they've included in their materials about kind of um, that isn't in our version um, that I think we might want to consider. Which um, you know, they talk about moral integrity. They talk about um, <clears throat> neutrality um, and some other adjectives um, that I can I can look up. But I I did wonder whether we wanted to put that in. <clears throat> so. One thing I would just note is in contrast to the commission in, in Maine, which was focused on the issues related to the Indian Child Welfare Act and the <laughs> tribes in Maine, this truth commission as it sits right now is got a much, much broader charge in dealing with not only the, uh, the, the indigenous Native American groups in Vermont, but also disabled Vermonters and Vermonters of color. Uh, so if you're requiring that the members be a Vermonter, but then also not have membership in that group, you may be significantly limiting who can serve on that panel. Um, and in a way that, uh, you know, it's, it's worth considering because if, if you can't be a Vermonter of color and you can't be a Vermonter with a disability and you can't be an indigenous Vermonter, then there aren't a lot of Vermonters left besides white Vermonters at that point. And so the question at that point is, is that appropriate for this commission as well? And obviously I don't take a position on this. I just wanted to point that out in a way, you know, in Maine you could have uh, you could potentially have a Native American who wasn't a member of the tribes, or you could have a, uh, a manor of color or a manor from some other background that might inform some of their work, and they could be perceived to be neutral, but also not be perceived to be um, potentially, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word here, but, you know, perceived to be um, you know, not have the, the level of sensitivity to these issues that might be necessary. So it's an issue I just want to raise. I don't, again, I can't take a position on this. Um, no, I think that's a fair point to keep in mind. Yeah. Like you said, if you, if you, if the clearest thing that I'll take from that comment is that if you, if, if you put guardrails up, on diverse Vermonters, you're going to end up with primarily um, an undiverse. Right. And it's, it's not to say that they may not have some, um, you know, some experience with advocating on behalf of, you know, uh, populations that are disadvantaged or something like that to meet the other characteristics, but the, the appearance of the panel could be such that it appears that they don't necessarily uh, have the, you know, an interest in, in exploring those truths, so. Right, but so then it leaves it to the selection panel as we've been talking about to make the determination over whether or not they think anybody that they're going to consider for the role can achieve the standards that we would put forth. And one thing you could do, uh, instead of designating, you know, that it shall not be a member of a specific group is, you know, to say something like, you know, uh, when you get into the moral character of the of the individuals, you can also say something along the lines of very similar to the way you know judges are perceived to be individuals with like um, an ability to put aside their personal views and judge the cases on their merits. Uh, and I, I'm the words are escaping me right now, but kind of looking for similar language to say these should be individuals who can, you know, judge things from a, a 
neutral standpoint, even if regardless of what their past experience is, <clears throat> you know, if, if that's something you're looking for. So it looks like, you know, uh, that they're not biased in the report they put out, but instead they've, they've reviewed the facts and done a thorough job of, of vetting the facts that come before them and the stories that come before them to put together a thorough and, and um, you know, uh, complete report of what the commission heard and, and found in its investigations. Can, can statute say um, <clears throat> the selection panel is encouraged to blah, blah, blah? Absolutely. Yeah. Rather than kind of as a, you know, must or. <clears throat> well, right. Uh, I mean, the, the difference between shall and may, I mean, reading, yeah. reading the Canadian commission again, which was really prescribed. So much of it was shall not, mm -hmm. you know, they shall not have public hearings, shall not lead to criminal proceedings, this shall not, which is. I think we tend to be, I don't have a lot of experience in hearing legislation <laughs> saying shall not, right? They become, <clears throat> you either shall do it or you may do it, but rarely do I experience shall not. But nevertheless, that's awesome. encouraging to me as a may, mm -hmm. you know, you're giving the option. Um, but the, as we go through this, that's what, We'll decide, we have to decide is which ones are shells and which ones are maze. Yeah. Well, I just, <clears throat> this is taking uh, a big step back that I maybe should have brought this up earlier, but like, so who convenes the stakeholders? You know, we haven't, you identified that as an issue. And I, <clears throat> I'd love to hear people's thoughts about that, you know, um, because, you know, Somebody's going to need to convene this group and help lead it through the process of selecting folks. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and until the commission hires staff and executive director and staff, then the commission can have more autonomy. But up until that point, yeah. it has to be convened and shepherded, directed. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and provided support. I mean, I, I was when Damien was reading it off, it sounded like who's if the selection process is going to be this fairly intense and open proceed, you know, uh, process of, of anybody who applies, their CV is made public, kind of like what we've been talking about a little, a little bit with the with the adjutant general is um, you know, does it go not so much that it goes through a vetting process, but that the process is gonna be could be um, could be really quite open. Um, who helps them get there? And I don't, I'm not sure if that's. I mean, I'm not sure if that's in the bill yet. Where in in other commissions, it's been clear that the commission has has administrative support from. People, but I think we're only looking for administrative support until. Well, it says it's called, the first part is called at the bequest of the Human Rights Commission. <clears throat> the very first meeting. Right. We have to talk to them to see if that's something that they would want to participate in. And um, as well as with racial equity, can we're looking for somebody to do? I mean, I think we've anticipated that the formation of the selection committee. And the process may take a small amount of time, but that the work of the selection committee will be taking up the larger amount of time. <clears throat> and I know using the adjutant general or the judicial review process that we provide in the statute, that there's a kind of administrative backup so that they could handle applications and <laughs> resumes and what's private, what's what what will be private, what'll be public throughout um process. So in other words, I think that's just what we were saying, not answered. Mm -hmm. Well I was just interested in if folks have had any thoughts about that. <clears throat>
I think this is where, mm -hmm. to John's point, this is where yeah. the administration or you know is, is involved, where the where the where this where where we're involved to shepherd it through. And I can't recall mm -hmm. in the reading in here how they how anyone has done that transition. It may be one of the one of the case studies. But. Yeah, it's it varies. Um, so in you know, some of the truth and reconciliation commissions, um, you know, they 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 speak to the formation of the panel, um, and then they let's just say here. Um, Just looking through some of these other uh, commissions here in South Africa, they don't speak to what sort of staffing they have. Um, but they did note that it, you know, I mean, they must have had significant staff because they've covered an enormous amount of ground in three months. Um, so in Greensboro, uh community groups could each appoint one person to the selection panel um and then the panel formed three months after the announcement of the mandate um and then ultimately 14 groups sent a member and then they uh, appointed their own chairperson and, and worked from there uh within victoria australia um they provided uh, assistant, assistance for the assessment panel uh, through a secretariat, uh, which coordinated uh, you know, technical and corporate support for the panel, received the nominations, maintained the record keeping process. I mean, clearly they had uh, reviewed nominations for completeness, assisted with completing nominations that needed additional information, assisted with scheduling meetings, developed protocols for public participation, uh, and provided any other required administrative support. I mean, clearly there's a lot of work here. Um, you know, the process in this bill doesn't actually house the selection panel in any one group. And, um, so Representative Kalaki referred to the earlier version where the selection panel was sort of housed with the Human Rights Commission. This version actually has that language removed. So um, unless I'm, I'm missing something here, but uh, so this version here, they you, you would potentially want to house this somewhere and or provide funding for additional staff to hire, you know, like a temporary administrative assistant or someone like that to at least handle, you know, processing incoming nominations, public comments, scheduling meetings, scheduling witnesses, et cetera, in much the same way, you know, that a committee assistant works with committee here, except understanding that this individual or individuals are likely to have be dealing with resumes, recommendations, and then potentially lots of witnesses testifying uh, who will have input on as to, you know, who should be nominated, uh, what their characteristics should be, who maybe is not a suitable candidate. I mean, there, there's all sorts of issues. Um, so it, it may make sense to have, you know, someone like the Human Rights Commission provide some staff support. The only thing that I could say with that, without wanting to put words into Bor Yang's mouth, is that they're already right. extremely limited on staff. So you probably need to provide funding 
um, for additional temporary staff with whoever whoever you put it with. Um, and right now, because there are no legislators, you can't put this with the legislative staff to run the uh, to handle the administrative functions. So, and I'm not suggesting that you add them. It's just no, but I, I mean, again, using the using the um, concept of using the concept of of like being careful about how we participate in this. I mean, I on one hand, I feel more comfortable with legislators because we're going to be more knowledgeable about what we're trying to create. But that said, that might be, you know, an initial, I don't know if that's an initially good step or not, you know, to say, again, we've been trying to be as neutral as possible. And again, once, once the work is, once the selection committee is done, then it's, you know, again, piece, people shear off. I mean, I would imagine that once, once that's done, the legislators shouldn't be a participant in the, in the selection of the commissioners. It's just that initial shepherding. So let, I mean, as long as we're just taking notes on questions that we have. Uh, if I could just say, uh, Damien, uh, page five. Uh, Did I miss this here? No, I don't know. I just conference uh, for the first meeting at the call of the Executive Area of Human Rights Commission. You are exactly right. I am sorry, I'm, I well, missed that. You know, without, without knowing if they're interested, it seems the right agency because they deal with systemic yeah. discrimination in our state. And if, if it could house the beginning part of it, convening all these stakeholders and then picking the selection panel. And then once the selection panel picks the commissioners, then it becomes its own entity. Um, and it could be housed privately, it could be housed there, it could be housed at the Mount Law School, it could be housed many different places, it could be housed in the administration. Maybe there's office space in one of our state buildings. It could have its own in independence, but I think it can't. Um, I think it needs that structure. To come into its own. All right, so I would bracket the human, just the director of the Human Rights Commission, just as a, let's just take that as a, you know, just as a proviso, Damon, as we're talking through stuff, just to bracket material until we know. Yeah. So that people can possibly, you know, maybe understand when they look at it that it's not, it's, it's almost the equivalent of a blank space, but that. I get my question is more to John. So what you're saying is like need that link to like an office so it has that, that kind of support during its like inception period. Say that again. It leaving, it leaving a link to something like the Human Rights Commission. So there is that back end support that is linked together throughout like our our traditional structure of these things. Right. So because it's linked to that, they have the access to yes. resources and humans yep. to help them move. Okay, I just wanted to make sure Rose. Totally. So it's worth noting along those lines that currently while the Human Rights Commission uh, calls the first man meeting of the stakeholders, and then the chair of the selection panel can call the meetings of the, the selection panel, there is no provision for office space or staff right now. And at least the way the bill is drafted, the Human Rights Commission is done with its involvement after the selection panel is appointed. Sure. So those are, again, just something to flag. Yeah, I mean, it's too soon to, it's too soon to know whether some other outside partnership has, I mean, no, no other outside partnership has been created. So right now it's, it would be office 
space, administration space that that the state would provide. Um, and I mean, we can't even really, I mean, unless and until uh, partnerships have been developed. There's got to be better language than that or knowledge than that. So, well, our other our cannabis control board, our group um, boards, when they have meetings, they don't have dedicated office spaces, they just use state buildings, right? The, can the cannabis control board has dedicated office. Oh, they do. Space. Okay, good. Yeah. Good to know. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so, like the liquor control board doesn't have dedicated office space, but they have the Department of Liquor and Lottery. So they use, yes. use their board. DLL yeah. boardroom. And there's a hearing room there that they use for their meetings. Um, you know, so Public Utilities Commission has its own office space. And, okay. And space yeah they're above the uh, people's united bank over here so there's a lot of the boards do have space um smaller sort of citizen boards may not have that kind of space and they may just schedule a, a conference room in a state building um, I think that's the case with the vermont commission on native american affairs they have access to the boardroom and accd or they used to right Matt, did you agree? Um, yeah, um, just as we're talking about these positions and that, you know, they were like, they were, there was the language of salary as a path of the superior court judge, uh, per diems, et cetera, et cetera. Has there been any type of uh, budget estimate put together about an annual? No. On this? So, I mean, that that's an open question for this. And part of that is going to be determined by one, how many commissioners are they citizen commissioners or salaried? What are their salaries? And then what do you envision for staffing support for them? Um, and it's hard to put together any sort of estimate until you until you have that in place. Uh, and then we could start working up an estimate. But until we've got more details like that, I mean. I think that fiscal estimate would just give you an enormous range. No, and I got you. And I, I was just, I know that there's been a ton of work uh, done on this in, you know, the months leading up to the session and a lot of conversations going on outside of the room. So I wasn't sure if people had maybe started ballparking that yet. Yeah, so like the, that. the idea we, when I asked JFO, how do you get a joint fiscal note on this? They are like everybody else under capacity and so they're not taking requests on financial on fiscal notes until we have a solid ask sure so um part of our process here we know that this bill is going to go to appropriations and they're going to make a final determination on how much money there may be so we may recommend, I mean, so our, our focus in the work should be focusing on what we think is the right size. And then they're going to take this bill up after we pass it out of committee, it'll transfer to them. And I know it's an if this passes out, I know that, I mean, I know this is a priority, we'd like to get it out, but we have to, you know, we have to do the, get the work done that we're satisfied with. So it goes to them, and that's when I think they would begin to um, hone in on what the budget could be. Um, but we just need to be clear, as clear as possible, so that if we if we think they need office space at this point in time, we put it in. Uh, if we think they need be commissioners, an executive director, an administrative person, a legal assistant, yeah. however many researchers. And we put it in, and then the, then the conversation shifts over to appropriations. Gotcha. Yeah, it's not. We don't have the capacity, I guess, to. We have a floating yeah. number. I mean, we do that. We we need to do the structure in a more defined way before we can actually target the. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, because there's a, there's 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 several pieces here, right? There's there's the office space appropriate equipment. Mm -hmm. However, I don't know how they pack that out. 
Um, then there's the per diems for the stakeholders, then the selection committee, um, and then how, how do the per diems work for the people who, do we give people who testify to each of the groups a per diem as well, or is it just their time? Um, so we're still, we have to have answers to, and, and then salaries, travel expenses, you know, other expenses that we can anticipate the, um, without it being a full budget, of course, because then once you get an executive director working with a series of commissioners, that's when the tight budget should be created, but we have to have mm -hmm. the other pieces in place. I'm going to the um, one of the things I think I'll do with Ron is uh, send an email to all of the people who are opposed in this list so far, starting on page four and taking kind of a Email poll on whether people or organizations are even interested in participating in this process. They've all been listed. This list has been taken from, um, has been compiled from a couple of different bills. So they are ostensible. We can assume that they're interested, but um, we need to find out. Uh, and also the letter we got from Will the White pointed out another handful of people that we should perhaps consider for the, um, for the on the disability side. Does that sound reasonable if I work with Ron? Set that out. Yep. Yes. Well, uh, uh, yes. I, I, I think that we would be consensus or clarity around the 18 to seven to three. And if you're part of the eight, is it 18 at the beginning or 11? It's about 18, what it could be plus or minus depending on. If you're one of the 18, you can still be one of the seven, but you can't be one of the three. Yeah, the seven can't be the three. Okay, so it's anyone who, the, the original 18, as long as they're not a seven can be a three. It could be one of the three. Correct. And I think that's good because I don't want to isolate too many people who have left. No, because we, we want experts in yeah. here who are, who, yeah, I mean, that's what we're asking. But I don't want to see people picking their own. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that would just need to be, maybe it's clear, but. Damien, are these notes, are these sufficient for you to just sort of, I mean, I'm assuming you're soaking it in and you'll synthesize it later. Is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to record notes here um, on the discussion when it seems like we narrow in on this needs to happen. Um, so um, And, you know, I think we're going to need to put that pretty fully loaded budget. What we expect because appropriations may not have, we want to have a conversation that we've been having. So you decide on it, what the compensation thing is, we decide on these things, and we look at other commissions that have these costs. We just take their costs for now, put those in for administration or office space or different things. As, as and we can identify where it's from, but I think we should be more specific versus less appropriation, so then they can. Sure, and I think that that's. I think that that's that's fine. We just I think if we're providing the positions, if we're providing the infrastructure that we think is the right infrastructure, you know, so. What happened with the Cannabis Commission, of course, is there was a conversation first about how many commissioners. 
and they ended up with three. And then there was an executive director, and I don't know what kind of administrative staff they have, but they just put in a budget request for 11 people. And I have no idea what they're there for or what they're supposed to do, but that was the, the Cannabis Commission determined that they needed 11 more FTEs. And they're wrestling over that right now. I don't think, I think we're, we're going down at least right now to the point where I think we're being as, as complete as we think. I don't, I don't envision 11 more people being needed off of this group of, uh, off of this group of individuals for the work that they would have to do. I don't, I, I mean, I think what's proposed so far is in a ballpark of what we would be expecting. I guess the process of determining how much it costs is a formula that whether appropriations in particular is used to it or whether JFO is used to it to say, okay, we need five office, we need five cubicles someplace, we need, you know, phones, we need um, computers, we need printers, we need, um, you know, I, I, I imagine that there's a square footage cost that goes into estimating office space in, in the state complexes. Um, but our bill also calls for, and I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead, Liz. <laughs> well, I'm gonna throw cold water on this because I'm not a fan of big government at all. And I just, I don't like the starting point of the salary that we've arrived at in this bill. I would rather start with something smaller and more modest in terms of um, compensation. I mean, we saw that the state of Maine was able to do it on a very minimal budget. And I feel as often in Vermont as not, we appoint large boards and commissions that cost a lot of money and include numerous new personnel in state government. Um, the intent of this legislation is phenomenal and impactful, but the cost of it is concerning to me. No, thank you. It is for us too. Um, I mean, I've heard just in, again, using ICTJ as a resource. I mean, Canada is a big country, but their process over five year period was $44 million. Um, I don't think we're going there, but your point is noted. I mean, and I think that's why, that's why it goes to um, appropriations and determines. I think that there's an element here of the commissioners. And I saw this, I saw this same language somewhere in, in here, but it was the idea that um, the, the commissioners this does not speak to the actual salary of what it might be, but the idea was that the commissioners would be, that this would be the only job that they had, rather than it being like a point three of somebody else's position already existing in state government. But that's the, that's the theory behind having the commissioners um, have a salary, whatever it may be. Um, well, we do say what the salary is. We do at this point, right? No, and that's something that that's a ballpark that we're shooting for. Um, again, everything is that's our work right now. Um, Representative Kalaki, no plastic. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry. The, the the whole administrator me is like. Um, I think we have in here that the commissioners can appoint other consultants to bring in um, research or to do research. So I, I just want to make sure, you know, we, we have a placeholder for that as well. So we don't, we don't get this appropriated out of here for 50% of what it really cost. Is, I guess my concern. Sure. Yeah, and that's, that's, and I don't have my arms around what this is. Right, so that's where again for us, while we're we can have a concern over the costs, we can have concern over the placeholders that we have. But I think at least here on Tuesday and up until the time where we move on, 
let's also fo focus more on what do we think is the right structure. Okay, yeah. And then, and then I'm not saying we're gonna leave this totally up to appropriations to make the final decision, but they do make a decision on, and, and they will ask us, do we think it's really necessary to have these groups? And we'll have that conversation when we're ready to. Um, Representative Plastic. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and not to belabor the issue, but to echo Representative Hangel's comments. Uh, I too have a big issue, not knowing anywhere near what this whole program could cost. And I do understand JFO's uh, inability due to being understaffed. I do understand the inability to uh, take this on uh, and come up with a an you know, official estimate for us uh, uh, on, until this becomes a more definite uh, bill. Um, but it's so hard for me to sit back and say, we like to see this, like see that, see that without having any, any idea what this is gonna cost. And I have no idea. Um, I, I can see it spiraling out there and just picking up different things and you gotta have this, gotta have that. And now we're not talking hundreds of you know, dollars here. We're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. So it's, it's, it's gonna be hard for me to, at this point, really like this bill. Uh, I do like certain parts of it, but not knowing what it's gonna cost and everything. And I, I just, it's, it's very difficult for me. And again, not to ramble on too much, but it's just difficult for me to, to commit myself, my vote to want to spend all kinds of money on something not even know what that all kinds of money is even gonna be. And again, I know JFO is very, very busy, but and like you said, Mr. Chair, you know, appropriations are good appropriations anyway. I don't sit here, but it certainly would help us, it'll help me anyway, to know up front what the estimates were. I mean, a part of certain commissioners or chairs or whoever it may be, <coughs> possibly and maybe even probably going to be receiving the salary of a superior court judge. I mean, that really bothers me. Um, that really bothers me. But that's, that's just my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Trown. So in, in boards and, uh, and uh, organizations that have been involved in over the years, it seems like this is often a conversation. So we are asking these commissioners to do a lot of work. Um, and as the chair said, suggesting that um, it would be a full-time job basically for that. But I can see the flip side of that when we're asking folks to take part in a project that could have far-reaching uh, impact um, on, their, um, on their group. And so the question then becomes, should the motivation be to take this on and to be part of this um, incredible undertaking that could, again, impact um, large numbers of Vermonters? Uh, or do we need to look at the tasks that will be assigned to them and hope to compensate them adequately to do the work? So that seems to be, and you know, there's legitimacy on both sides. And I hear the cost argument from both of you uh, but I brought it up, and I don't. Um, I don't argue against that. I think that this certainly is a consideration that we need to take, and that, uh, and that maybe we can reach uh, a, a, an agreement or or a place where uh, we can think in terms of relying on people who want to get involved in this to do the right thing. Yes, with that process. Yeah, thank you. And Mr. Chair, please don't get me wrong. I think this is a, this is a, is, a, is a very good program here. It probably is, it's, well, not probably, it's necessary and everything. It's just, I, I, I personally at this point think it's way too big for what we, again, not knowing the cost factor, but I'm not against the, uh, 
the commission at least. I just think it needs to be affordable and we don't need to make another great big huge uh, strain on, on state government uh, uh, salary and benefits. And, and again, if we knew if this was, you mentioned that yourself, if this is going to be a um, full time job, a part time, full time basis, part time basis, you know, it's, it's just, I think a lot of that has got to do with what it's going to cost. And it's, it's very hard. It's like if, if I was to go out and buy a brand new car, I, I have a budget to deal with and I know about what I can afford. So I might want to go out and buy a $150,000 car, but I know I really can't afford it. So I'm going to settle for uh, you know, a $30,000, $35,000 car or something. Uh, I get Thank you, Chip, for understanding that. Uh, <coughs> Thank you for understanding that. I do. I'm not trying to be hard here, and I, I really think this is a, is a great thing to be doing here, and, and it's something that we, we should do. I just don't know how, how many people do we need to do this? And you know, that is the first thing we need to figure out. <laughs> that is the first thing we need to figure out. Roger that. Roger that. You know, there's strength in numbers, but there's also lots of money in numbers. Um, so, sure. So, I'm not against it. I just want no, to, I, I just think we have a little. No, and I, hear the, the I hear that, um, Representative, and I appreciate. I mean, if we all are in this job <laughs> appreciative of costs. And um, I guess what I would ask of the committee, you know, does I think we're at a point in this conversation where perhaps a way to look at the work we're doing for the next couple of days anyway is what's to continue the focus on what is the right thing to do? Because the in, in terms of what this is trying to accomplish, <clears throat> because then when we start talking about the costs and 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 we're, then we start getting into the conversation of what's possible or what may be possible. What can we, not so much what do we settle for, though I suppose that's part of it. But I think right now the idea of, and I can appreciate that if the, if the cost is, you know, hindering a way of looking at the whole picture. Um, but I think my, my interests right now in the next few days is to like get an idea of what would be the right structure for the commission. Even if it's just a purely theoretical one. And then we can start considering, because I, I can't anticipate what appropriations are going to do. <clears throat> You know, this, and, and I understand that looking forward to a point that we have to have a better understanding of what it costs. There's no question we're not going to vote on this without a better understanding of what we're putting forward before it even gets to appropriations. Um, but I would like us to focus, on, you know, just keep focusing on what is the right and most complete structure that we can imagine that would give this commission an opportunity for success. Um, and then we will move on. Once we come close to that, then we can then we can move on to the you know more precise costs. We can in the meantime we can ask. I don't know, Damien, who do we ask? BGS on you know, and again I Maybe we just have to find out of how do we get preliminary numbers on things like office space costs and square footage costs and how the state charges different commissions for different things. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, JFO is going to have some the best sort of information on how they estimate that. Um, and I know, like I looked back in my emails and for 2020, you know, the estimate for a citizen member of a committee was 126.25 per meeting. 
So we obviously, we have estimates that we work up for these things. Um, I can reach out to my colleagues over at JFO and see if they can give me just some really rough numbers that we would use to estimate, you know, for example, benefits costs and uh, square footage and that sort of thing so that we can at least get a sense of, you know, if you're saying one full-time employee at a salary of 60,000 and I'm throwing out ballpark numbers here, you know, what, it, what are the benefits costs there? So we can get a total compensation plus benefits idea of like, if you've got four employees at $60,000 a year, are you talking $300,000 or are you talking $400,000 in costs? You know, and, and that's obviously there's a potentially huge range depending on what the benefits add to that base salary. Um, you know, I, all of this is stuff that is is way outside my area of knowledge. And what is there, and I mean, again, we don't have an understanding yet of like, what does limited service employee mean in terms of benefits? What the, you know, what does, mm -hmm. you know, is a three-year job a temp job, you know, a four-year job a temp job, or is that a, you know, temp to full? Is it, I mean, all those things that, that we don't have, we don't have a, a file yet on that. Representative Clark. Yeah. Wonder though, Davian, if it's uh, another way to do it is our if you pick the commission that's closest to what we're imagining, whether it's a cannabis control board or whichever one. Um, and is there annual budget of public record? <clears throat> and can we just see what the annual budget is of the cannabis control board and all the line items? And then we can look at it and say, okay, in our construct, this makes sense for this administrative stuff, this makes sense for and just use those numbers. Would joint fiscal office have those? Well, that would be in the budget bill from last year. Um, <clears throat> so we take a quick look at Act 74 from last year, which was the budget. So Cannabis Control Board uh, had a budget of $650,000 for personal services, which is salaries and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and was there any other administrative costs or other so personnel? Let me look. Uh, All right, committee, actually, I'm going to put a timeout right now because um, it's 2.15. Let's take 10 minutes.